Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm back with Professor Schreiger and we're going to have to do a bit of a journal club. And the reason we have to do a bit of a journal club is because there's another hydroxychloroquine paper out and I was going to ignore it because um, we've had so many negative articles at this point. It just seems like, what's that special word when there isn't the likelihood that the thing you're going to study is actually, you should study, you should work? It's what's there's a special word. Are you talking about equipoise? That's the thing. A lot of people are saying there's no equipoise here. You need to stop studying this thing. Um, and I guess that means there's no real chance that this for therapy could be effective. Is that what that means? Well, the concept of equipoise really comes in from a moral point of view, which is if I have two treatments and I don't really know which is better for you, it's perfectly legitimate for me to say to you, hey, be in a study. We'll try to figure this out. But if I have data that suggests that treatment A is better than treatment B, it is a bit of a moral quagmire to suggest to somebody we're going to ra randomize you to A or B when we have reason to believe that A is better. So as the evidence piles up uh, that, that a drug works or doesn't work, it becomes harder and harder to do a randomized trial of that drug. Um, people hide behind that as well. Uh, you know, some would argue that the TPA and stroke required further study. But the manufacturer said, no, uh, it would be unethical because we don't have equipoise. Our first study showed that it's better. So all of this is subjective and in the eye of the beholder. But yes, um, you know, a fair amount of, of, of randomized trial evidence has accrued suggesting that hydrochloroquine doesn't have much to offer, if anything, and may in fact be harmful. So given that uh, background, there is this article, it was published, actually, first it was on the MedRx site, and now it's actually been published in the International Journal of Infectious Diseases uh, last week, late last week. And it basically said, uh, from Henry Ford Hospital, we took a bunch of patients, some of them got hydroxychloroquine, some of them didn't, and guess what, this time it worked. But there seems to me, as the non-methodologist looking at this, some big problems, like there was huge differences in the age between the treatment groups and the non-treatment groups, like 20-year differences, which could explain everything as far as I'm aware. Then they do some statistical magic and say, but really, um, it did work. So that's why I wanted you to take us through this, Dave. I think it's going to be a really useful exercise in methodology. So do your thing. Share your screen. All right. I will do that. Okay. Terrific. So um, I've made a couple of slides here just to make it easier to understand the study. Um, and I should say that although this is published in the journal, it's published as a pre-proof. And as you'll see on some of the pages, um, they have pre-proof written all over them. And what does this mean? Well, in, in the world of publishing right now, um, you have these things like MedArchive that you just referred to, where anybody can go and post their article immediately. And most journals will accept that. And one could argue in a fast-changing field like COVID that who needs a regular journal when you can just publish on MedArchive and get everybody to be aware of your study. So to compete with that, some of the private publishing houses like Elsevier have gone to this method where journals can look at a paper and say, yeah, we're going to accept this, and we will offer you on our website essentially the MedArchive feature of posting immediately, even though we reserve the right to do further editing of your paper and correction, and this is not the official version. This is the preprint version. It's a little bit better preprint, presumably, than MedArchive because someone has looked at it and said we're accepting it for this journal. So it has had some level of scrutiny, scrutiny, but the level of scrutiny is not completely clear. And so just be aware, this is not a fully peer-reviewed paper that we're looking at. So that, that's the first thing. That's another interesting thing. So I found another, yet another level of potentially uh, problematic publications. Okay, continue. Right, so just be aware that the final publication of this paper in IJID might look just like what we're looking at or might look very different. And we just don't know that right now. And, you know, it raises, you know, all kinds of questions about, you know, who's publishing what and when. Because all, if you imagine you're a journal, you don't want to be left out of the COVID rampage and publish nothing on COVID. It would be like, where have you been the last four months if you publish nothing on COVID? On the other hand, there's this deluge of papers, and they're all sort of in this waterfall cascade of trickling down from the top journals, where most of them are rejected out of hand without review, to the second tier journals where the same thing happens. In Annals of Emergency Medicine, for example, I don't have hard data yet, 
But my guess is that we're only sending out for peer review something in the order of between one in 10 and one in 20 submissions. The others are being rejected out of hand, which gives you some sense of the quality. But that's not to say those papers aren't being published as they trickle down to second and third and fourth tier journals so that every paper finds a home somewhere. And it's just very hard to know, you know what the quality of what you're reading is unless it's really been vetted by a top flight journal. And even then with the retractions in Lancet and NAGM, you're not sure whether you, whether you can fully trust that. So uh, this is certainly uh, a let the buyer or let the reader beware mode that we're in as one has to maintain scrutiny about everything. So it's important to know what you're reading and what process it's gone through. So this hospital, the Henry Ford Health System is six hospitals in Southern Michigan, including the big 800 bed Henry Ford hospitals and some satellites. And the first thing I wanna point out, and this is a direct quote from the paper, is that they said, look, you know, we had word early on, we're seeing these COVID patients that hydro hydroxychloroquine may work, azithromycin may work. So we developed a protocol. And all the patients, all six hospitals use the same protocol to determine whether the patient got hydroxychloroquine alone or in combination with azithro or azithro alone. And this was all in an institutional guideline and that's how patients were treated. So what does that say? That says, this is not a random process of who gets what. There is some algorithm that determines whether you're gonna be in one of four groups, neither of these two drugs, one or the other of these two drugs or be it both of these two drugs. So there is no reason to believe that the patients will be similar between the two groups. And in fact, four groups, and in fact, the existence of the algorithm tells you that by intention, the patients should be different because whatever the rules are, which aren't shared in the paper that determines what you get, presumably you're using clinical variables to take you down one alley or another into one of these four groups. So by their own declaration, these patients should be different. So this is not a randomized trial. This is not a randomized trial. Okay. So who are these patients? They have to be adults. They have to be admitted through the ED. It's not clear whether they have a whole lot of direct admissions who were encountered or whether every patient in the Henry Ford system is admitted through the ED, that there are no direct admits. But they had to be admitted through the ED. They had to have a positive PCR at some point during their hospital stay for COVID. And this had to be their first admission for COVID. So that's who the patients are. So they're admitted patients with COVID. The design is a retrospective chart review, mostly using electronic resources dividing the patients into the four groups we mentioned, hydroxychloroquine alone, meaning, when I say alone, meaning they didn't get it with azithromycin, but they could have been getting other agents as well. Uh, azithromycin alone, meaning no hydroxychloroquine, both of them, plus whatever else they got, and other, meaning neither of these. But again, they could have been getting other drugs. And again, this is, Mel, you want to kick it in again? Not randomized. <laughs> So what's the primary outcome? The primary outcome is mortality. How do they deal with the fact that they know that these patients are supposed to be different since an algorithm using clinical features sorted them into these four groups? They do a Cox regression. They control for age. They control for sex. They control for cardiovascular disease, lung disease, comma, MSOFA score, and SAO2. And then to check that, they do a propensity analysis with the same variables. Now, what is a propensity analysis? It's a mathematical technique to try to create a randomized trial within an observational study, basically by look, trying to find patients who, look, who have the same probability of receiving either treatment. So if you have one, two patients who look alike on all these clinical variables, um, such that they were equally likely to receive hydroxychloroquine or not, you say, well, those two patients, because they were equally likely by this set of characteristics, we can kind of pretend like they're in a randomized trial, that those two people were just randomly assigned to one or the other. That's the myth. Of course, it's only as good as the variables that you use in the propensity analysis. But that's what we're dealing with here, and we'll take a look at that. So let's look at some results. Just to orient you, the first column is all 2,541 patients, and then we have the four groups. Neither med, hydrochloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, and both. When we look at mortality, which is what they're all excited about, and this is an interesting style of paper in that it presents its finding as the first thing in 
table one, where normally table one would just be the characteristics of the patient. But they put it right up there front and center. We'll see if that remains when the paper goes to press or whether it'll be in a more traditional place. But in any case, their big finding here is that mortality is so much lower in the hydroxychloroquine group at 13.5% compared to the other groups. And um, the length of stay, interestingly enough, is um, not the lowest in that group. Um, and I don't know how much of that is due to mortality or how much of that is just due to length of stay, um, which raises some interesting questions. So now let's look at the age of the patients. When you look at their means, they're relatively similar. But take a look at their medians um, right in this region here, and we see that you have a median age receiving neither med of 71, then 53 in the hydroxychloroquine group, and 64 and 62 in the other two groups. So that's a pretty wide range in age. And then uh, if we break that down to less than 65 years and more than 65 years, again, some pretty dramatic differences where um, less than half the patients in the hydroxychloroquine group were over 65 um, as, con as contrasted to say the neither med group. Um, so there's some big differences there. Um, continuing on with the patient characteristics, also considerably large differences in race. And we see that disproportionately more black people received hydrochloroquine alone. Um, and I don't know why that is. And I don't know why, I doubt the algorithm sorted people on race, but it may be that certain people had certain characteristics that were associated with race, which got them into one group or another. But that degree of disparity where only 27% or 28% of white people are getting hydrochloroquine alone seems odd when it's so much higher for the other groups. So a lot. the point here is there's a lot of difference between groups um, on all of these characteristics, uh, including BMI, which we know is a known risk factor here the hydroxychloroquine patients actually tended to be heavier to some extent, um, certainly compared to the neither med patient. But again, we don't know why that is. It may be that if you look perfect, you know, you, your O2 sat is good and this is good and that is good, but you're heavy, you qualify for, you know, they throw some hydroxychloroquine at you. And not surprisingly, if that's your only problem, you do well. We just don't know because we don't know what they did to put the patients into these groups. Um, so it may be that the sick patients received neither of these meds. They received heavy hitters, um, which is why they don't look as, as if they have as much chronic disease. The people who looked well but had some chronic diseases sort of prophylactically received hydroxychloroquine. We just don't know. Continuing, uh, if we look at some of the characteristics of, of their condition on arrival. Um, you know, you see the O2 sats and they look pretty similar. Um, but again, the hydroxychloroquine group seems to have a, a few more people, a few less people who are normal and a few more people with mild hypo hypoxemia which again, we don't know exactly what that means, again, compared to the neither med group. So it's just very hard to know why the patients are in these groups and what it means. Um, here we have uh, things about if they ever were in the ICU. And if you look at the median ICU days in the third row, recognize that this is not a particularly sick population per se in that half, actually 75% of the patients never saw the ICU in all groups. Right, because the 75th percentile is zero in each of the groups. So you don't have a whole lot of patients spending time in the ICU. So these are not your sickest patients. So even if you believe that this worked, you certainly only have data about patients who are largely not sick enough to warrant ICU care. And same thing with vent days. Uh, not surprisingly, if they're not in the ICU, they're probably not on a ventilator. And vent days are, are pretty damn small here. Interesting disparity of all the things we've discussed. Have a look at given steroids. Yeah, this one's huge. And here we have a randomized controlled trial, which says, um, particularly in sicker patients, steroids may well be useful. And here you have twice as many people uh, 
compared to the neither med group or the azithro alone group um, getting steroids. Um, and so that could explain everything right there. Um, and so the same thing with some differences. Uh, oh, I don't want to pronounce it today. We'll just look at the last row. Anyway, thank you so much. <laughs> Um, so now let's take a look at figure one, which is also kind of interesting. So this is a traditional Kaplan-Meier plot. You start with everybody alive in the upper left-hand corner, and people are going to die. And with that, the curves drop. With each person who dies, the curve goes down. So the group that did worst is the red group, which is the neither drug. But again, we have reason to believe that the people who didn't get either of these drugs were the sicker people. And that's why they didn't get either of these drugs. They got other drugs. So it's not surprising that they're dying. What I find sort of interesting is, is when the difference is occurring. And it's very early on, in the first couple of days, that this seems to be making a difference. So one possibility is, is that uh, this is a magic drug, and it, it just, you know, you go from deathly ill. But mind you, most of these people weren't in the ICU, which is also kind of puzzling. Um, another, though, is if we look all the way on the right, uh, the average time that uh, hydroxychloroquine was given was on day one. Um, and I don't know whether they count if there's a day zero, whereas for azithromycin, it's at, at day 0.57. So one possibility here is, is that if you left a patient longer before you entered them in the study, they were more likely to declare themselves as being too sick to be in the hydroxychloroquine group because those patients on average entered the study later. So you get rid of all the sickies who announce themselves as being sick, hi, I'm sick, and then what's left are less sick patients. So that's one way to look at this um, in terms of trying to understand it. Now, I wanna point out, then they do the propensity analysis scoring. Now, what they're showing on this slide is that the patients look quite different when you look at the unmatched patients. And again, there's 1,900 patients who got hydroxychloroquine and 500 patients who did not. And we see that their age distribution is very different. Um, their racial distribution is quite different. And their uh, being overweight is quite different. So then you do this propensity analysis to try to get the patients to be more alike. But when you do this, you go from 556 patients in the not given hydroxychloroquine group to 190. And from 1,900 patients to 190, you only have 10% of the hydroxychloroquine patients left. Why do you have so few patients? Because they couldn't find a match for the patient. That tells you how different the patient populations are in each of these cohorts. They can't even find someone to match with them. So now you're talking about a study of 380 patients out of what was 2,500 patients. So you have no idea how these smaller group of patients matches in terms of, of any of these things to the larger group. And so yes, you can try to propensity match them, and again, you don't know using the variables that they have whether that propensity match is going to be adequate enough to make groups that are at similar risk for the outcome. But to do that in this case, they had to lose almost all the patients, which just tells you how different the patient populations are. And so um, looking at this further, you know, look at the difference in steroids, 77% and 36%, and then to get them to be similar, which they do, they lose almost all the patients. Same thing with, uh, say it again, Mel. It's not a randomized trial. <laughs> and also, you were going to pronounce for me toxilizumab. Oh, to uh, toxilizumab versus no toxilizumab. Huge differences. Right. So you're seeing a lot of differences there. You're seeing differences in the ICU and the ventilator, all these things. And to get them to line up, which they eventually do, you're use, losing almost all the patients, which tells you how different these groups are. I mean, sometimes when you do a propensity analysis, you can retain 90% of the patients. Here they're retaining, you know, 10% of the patients, basically, who got the drug. So uh, not a particularly useful propensity analysis. So what we have here is a not fully peer-reviewed retrospective cohort study, not a randomized trial, where the cohorts were defined by an unspecified algorithm that they used, and we don't know what variables were precisely in that algorithm. One would think that if you're gonna to try to sort this all out, you would wanna know what those variables were and make sure they were included. But we just have no reason to know one way or the other whether the variables they did use to adjust this 
did a good job of creating two groups that had they been given the same treatment, they would have had the same outcome. Because the absence of that condition is what's called confounding, right? The ideal study, the ideal randomized trial says, if you gave both groups the same treatment, whichever one it was, they would have the same outcome minus random error. And here, it is very, very hard to believe that patients selected for a specific drug because of their clinical condition are going to have the same outcome had they been given the same drug. It defies logic. So I don't put too much credence in this paper. Um, it won't be the last one we see like this. Everybody has data. Everybody wants to publish. Everybody will find a journal to publish them. But this certainly wouldn't change my beliefs about this particular drug uh, in this particular condition. Yeah, given what we already know using Bayes' theorem, this doesn't move the needle very much. Um, and also, there was another thing that I found that was bizarre. They found white race, not black race, as a high-risk feature for um, complications, which, again, just suggests no face validity. Right. Unless, again, all of the black patients qualified for one of the other agents because they were sicker or came to the hospital later or all of those things, and therefore you get, have a bias that way that explains why they're having a paradoxical result. Uh, that was, thanks for taking us to school, Professor. Really useful. I learned about propensity analyses and the limitations of such a big statistical thing. You can't uh, make a randomized trial out of something that's clearly so not even not randomized. It's like the opposite of not randomized. Right. It's intentional sorting of patients and then trying to unsort it, but not using the rules that were used to sort it in the first place. So it's, it's a bit odd. Thank you, sir. You're a good man. I don't care what they say. Much appreciated, Mel. Always a pleasure.